A few years ago, my sister and I got into an argument. And it was all about dialogue. She said that we were simply having a dialogue, a conversation about different ideas. And I said, no, we are having a debate. And she said, well, they're the same exact thing. And I said, no, they're not the same exact thing. So you may be wondering, well, how are they different? This is what chapter four brings to us. We'll talk about the definition of dialogue, what is not dialogue, attitudes necessary for dialogue, and what dialogue looks like in action. So if you're ever in a debate, trying to figure out, well, what is dialogue in the first place? Here's the definition. It is simply communication that encourages all to speak and fully listen to understand others. So if you are having a conversation with someone and that other person isn't speaking very much and doesn't really feel like they can speak very much or vice versa where you feel like that person's dominating and that you can't get your, vo your words in or even have your voice heard, then you're probably not in a dialogue. Because the dialogue is really going to be about mutual respect. That everyone should be heard fully. Now there are four characteristics that your textbook points out that are necessary to have good dialogue. Civility, presentness, unconditional positive regard, and mutual equality. Now, civility has been talked about a lot in communication circles. I've seen a lot of different articles popping up with this as a focus. If we were to simplify a definition on civility, it means treating others with respect. But it goes a little bit deeper than that, so let's break it down to different parts. Politeness. Politeness is simply the act of showing consideration for others in accordance with societal expectations. So if I'm sharing with you something personal and you pull out your cell phone, that would be impolite. Society says that when someone is sharing something personal and potentially vulnerable about themselves, you should give them your full attention. Please and saying thank you. Those are also things that we consider polite in our culture. Then there's respect for others. Keep in mind that respect is simply the practice of acknowledging the inherent dignity of other people as human beings. One of my favorite philosophers is Martin Buber. And he said, at times we treat people like people. It's an I-U relationship. But other times we treat people as it's. That we have an I-it relationship. That person is merely just an object that we can use to further something that we want for ourselves. So think about it. When was the last time you used somebody as an it? Was it the cashier of your checking out who you just left your money out there for while you were on your cell phone? You didn't even have eye contact. You didn't even tell them have a good day. That doesn't seem so civil, does it? Doesn't really seem like you treated that person with respect. Then there's respect for self. So again, civility is this idea of treating others with respect. But a good part of treating others with respect is also knowing how to treat yourself. This may mean being assertive. Keep in mind I said assertive, not aggressive. So when you're assertive, you clearly, calmly, and confidently make your positions and ideas known to others. When you're assertive, you don't disrespect other people and their beliefs. You don't disvalue what they have to say. You truly want a conversation where everyone can feel involved. I had one class where one person brought up the idea of the golden rule. Treat others as you would treat yourself. And people have heard that before, that you should treat others kindly. Many, many, many different religions all over the globe have that same concept in their religion. It's pretty much a universal concept. But the one thing that struck me as different here was treat others like yourself. If you treat others better than yourself, then you're not really following that universal ideal, are you? 
Then there's the idea of presentness, giving your full attention to the moment. Now this is easier said than done, right? There could be distractions. We have a thousand different things going on at once. You have the chores that you need to do at your, your house. You have work that you need to do for school. You have friends and family members who want to talk to you and have conversations. Yet you still want to watch all your favorite TV shows and get caught up. It can be really hard at times to have a good dialogue because we have so many distractions. So in that case, you need to focus in on the conversation. You may need to go to a quiet room, turn off the TV, turn off the computer, put the stove on low. There is many different things that you can do to be present in that moment. But again, it's so difficult to achieve because we still have a thousand things going on in one minute when we try to multitask. And that's really hard to do. And just like any skill, becoming present in what's going on around you, it needs to be developed. Then there's the concept of unconditional positive regard, accepting others with a positive attitude. Now this is going to involve taking some risk. It may mean understanding that you have to trust people, even if trust is risky. It may mean talking to someone that's completely different from you, but just trying it for the sake of trying it. It can be quite risky. But for the most part, we tend to realize that most people are actually really kind. Most people aren't going to have it out for us. Keep in mind that having unconditional positive regard doesn't mean that you always agree with that person. It doesn't mean that you become a doormat for them to walk all over. And that you always become the yes man or the yes woman. It means that you want what's best for both parties, yourself included. Then there's mutual equality. The assumption that each person can make an equal contribution. So if you've ever sat in a classroom with the one person who's dominated every single question the teacher throws out, or maybe you've been that person to answer every single question the teacher throws out, then you may have had an issue with mutual equality. Did you give other people the time to answer the question as well? Did you wait for a silence? At times, as an instructor, I've had to tell somebody that they weren't allowed to answer any more questions until at least five minutes of silence, or until somebody else answered the question first, just to make sure they realize everyone has something to contribute equally. Now, there are several actions that create mutual equality. One is collaborating. Collaborating means that you try to work towards a solution. Keep in mind, collaborating is different than compromising. Compromising is you have to give up a little bit to get something back. Collaborating is working together to make sure everyone gets 100% of what they want. Then there's sharing your goals. This can also be a little scary at times, right? To share your goals with everybody involved and think that, yes, they are all going to equally contribute to my success. Yeah but that can encourage dialogue. And then also paraphrasing. Remember that the entire goal of communication is to have shared meaning. So if you don't understand someone, you can't have true dialogue. When you paraphrase, you are interpreting what someone said and repeating it back to them in some way, maybe in your own words. And that way you ensure that you fully understand them, that you have that shared meaning. Now let's talk about what isn't dialogue, the conversation I had with my sister. A monologue is where one voice is respected. You know those type of conversations where people think they're having a conversation, but really they just kind of beat you down until you agree with them. Yeah, that's a monologue. Where one person focuses only on themselves, and then magically when it's time to talk about you, they get tired or they get busy. Again, that's a monologue. 
What also isn't dialogue is a debate. We have two, comp two different parties competing to win the argument. There's competition, especially competition to win. It's probably not a dialogue. Because in dialogue, everybody wins, not just one. Now there are several attitudes that are necessary to have a true dialogue. Open-mindedness. Coming in and realizing, I am not going to have these negative judgments about people. I'm going to try to keep my mind open and aware of the perceptions I have and just embrace what someone has to tell me. Easier said than done at times. Then there's genuineness, the act of being direct and honest and straightforward regarding what we believe and think. Again, this can be easier said than done, especially when there's something controversial or something that may make us vulnerable that we have to say, well, this is how I see it. Then there's agreeableness, the degree of which you're agreeable with others. Now, agreeable communicators not only seek to find things on which they agree, but they recognize that the person that they're having a conversation with isn't in an argument with them. They don't equate someone's character or identity simply with one position. So when you do disagree, you still find other attributes of who they are that you still like. Then there's ethical integrity. Integrity is simply the consistency of your character. That just because you're in a different situation or with a different person, you don't change all your values and beliefs to fit that one person. So having these attitudes will lead you into having dialogic behaviors. First, think about separating facts from interpretation. There's a lot of times when people tell you something you may want to put your ideas in the situation, what you believe. But you have to remember to do a perception check. Am I just attributing things to their behavior? What actually happened? What did I see? What did they tell me? Think about asking clarifying questions as well. Keep in mind that in a dialogue, your clarifying questions do not need to attack or express a judgment towards the other person. So a non-dialogic question would be, can't you see how that job is beneath you? That feels like you're attacking the person, right? But a dialogic question would be, well, what new responsibilities will you have in this position? It doesn't have any attack based flow to it. It sounds like it's really just trying to go deeper in understanding. Another thing you need to consider is allowing others to speak fully. If you've ever been in a conversation where someone was interrupted, you know how awkward that is. Keep in mind that interruptions not only hurt the speaker, but they also hurt the listener. Another dialogic behavior is taking notes. Taking notes shows a physical expression of being fully present to what's going on in the situation. Additionally, taking notes is a great way of making sure that you fully understand someone. It keeps you from forgetting a comment or a question that you have. Another idea with dialogic behavior is to give your complete attention. Going back to this idea of being present completely in the, the moment. And then lastly, remember to own your own statements. So use I language instead of you language. You language always puts people on the defensive. It sounds like you're blaming them. You never listen to me. That sounds like I'm attacking you, right? Whereas I language focuses on how I'm feeling about the situation. I don't feel heard. In that example, the, the focus wasn't on the other person. It wasn't about me attacking someone. It was purely on how I felt. So now I hope you have a better understanding of what dialogue is, what it isn't, as well as the attitudes and behaviors that consist of a true dialogue.